All right. Well, welcome back to Sub2 Investor. Um, today, we have a very special guest, somebody who was a part of my program, and uh, they just finished their first Subject2 deal. Very excited to welcome Ray to the show. I'm happy to be on. So really what I want to do, I want to talk about this deal you just closed. Um, so many awesome things about this deal. This was a Subject2 um, and a seller finance deal, so a hybrid deal. But why don't you, you know, introduce yourself, who you are, your background in real estate, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. So a little bit about me. Um, I have my own business. It's a photo and video productions business where I capture real estate. What kind of got me into investing was I was young and I was watching too much HGTV at the time, probably. And I ended up buying my first property in 2010. I didn't really know what house hacking was, but I started putting roommates in there because I didn't want to live by myself. And long story short, I caught the real estate bug by doing that. With me shooting real estate, I was able to find more deals. And now I have uh, four units, including the sub two deal that I just closed recently. So out of those four units, uh, the two of them are rentals. And my hopes is after the renovations in my sub two deal, I'll have three rentals. And yeah, that's where I'm at right now. Fantastic. And so why don't you tell us a little bit about um, how this deal came about? Where'd you get the lead from? Yeah. So um, I've had a buddy um, and he, you know, I kind of mentioned to him before that hey, what are your thoughts on maybe doing a subject two deal if you ever wanted to sell your house, right? And he didn't really know what sub two deal was, but he kind of understood a little bit about creative financing. Um, I had mentioned it to him just because he, he had showed some interest in maybe like selling his home in the future. Um, you know, he didn't, he wasn't interested at the time, but he came back to me and said, hey, um, I want to kind of explore those options now, right? Things have changed in his life and he was thinking this might be a better route. And of course, me being a real estate investor, I wanted to look into it a little bit more, understand, you know, his rates and, and everything to see if it would make sense. And that's how I acquired the deal because it was somebody who I have established relationships with. The biggest issue is <laughs> at the time, I didn't know how to close the sub two deal. And that's why I reached out to you, Hans. Yeah, good deal. And um, how did you become aware that Subject 2 was even a possibility? Why was that on your radar in the first place? So I had been uh, you know, attending a lot of local RIAs. I probably do a, like what most people do is do a lot of research on YouTube, trying to understand you know, how to be a real estate investor and what my strategy um, is going to be. Um, I've always been... Uh, long-term hold kind of guy. And I kind of came by that by accident by buying my first home, right? Since I bought it in 2010, I saw um, massive appreciation from the property. So that's kind of what showed me, hey, this might be a better route than like the traditional way of putting money into the 401k, right? Because in that 10 year time frame, my property had more than doubled in value. And since there was a lot of great uh, programs during 2010, I was able to get into my home with zero down and actually got like an $8,000 tax credit because of what the government was offering at the time. So for zero down, a, a bit of credit, putting roommates in it, I just saw the benefits of what real estate uh, was able to offer me. So yeah, that's really what got me in. I started going to local RIAs, doing a lot of YouTube research, which then ended up me landing on subject two and creative financing. Got it. Makes sense. Yeah. So you saw that appreciation, did some house hacking, saw the value in real estate, um, purchased a couple rental properties. And then why so then why exactly creative finance? I mean, was it why not just go out, buy another property, put 10 to 30 percent down? Why not do, just do that? Okay. So for me, um, I have been doing a lot of the conventional lending because I, I would live in the home, maybe make some improvements and then buy the next one. So that I was kind of just jumping to the next property that way. Um, it was easy for me um, because I was still, you know, had my own business and trying to create that. Um, but long story short, I got into creative financing because 
um, one, you maybe you didn't need as much capital. And two, um, you know, with me, um, you know, doing this with all my own money, I needed a way to, you know, just think about different strategies. So I didn't have to wait so long until I could buy my next property. Yeah. So really it's that it was the upfront capital required that, um, that made the switch in your mind to, oh, maybe I can acquire properties with less money down than the conventional way of putting down 20 or 30% on an investment property. That's correct. Yeah. Makes total sense. So, so why don't you tell us about this deal that you um, conjured up from uh, just talking about, you know, just you sounds like you casually put out to your friend, to your buddy uh, that, hey, can I buy your house? Like kind of almost like it was a, a backhanded comment or like a joke or something, but it turned into an actual reality. Uh, why don't you tell us about, um, well, first of all, just tell us where is the property? So you're in the Seattle area, but where is this property exactly? So the property is in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but in specifically the part of Granville. And that's where the, the property is located. You can probably get to Grand Rapids within, I don't know, 10 minutes. It, exactly. Um, to kind of give you a little insight on, you know, our relationship, right? I've known the guy for 17 years. We used to game together online. Uh, we actually never met until I ended up uh, flying down to shoot his wedding because I'm also a wedding photographer. And, um, you know, that was the first time we met, but we've known each other online. You know what I'm saying? Now, we're in a virtual age and, yeah, we've just known each other. So long story short, you're right. You know, it was just more casual conversation. He knew I was a real investing in real estate. Didn't quite understand exactly what I was kind of doing, but he knew what I was trying to build. And... But he had, he had his own business and he was trying to get that going and it just wasn't particularly going as well as he thought it was going to go and it put him in some situations financially that um maybe wasn't in the in the best place you know that he wanted to be in so he was just trying to look for a quick exit he his wife uh, family ended up having a place for them to stay. They had a family estate. So he knew that he'd have a great place to live. Um, and so that made me feel a lot better about maybe working out this deal. Um, so I offered him and pitched him the idea, hey, let's do a subject two and let's talk about the numbers and see if it would work since you have a great place to stay afterwards. And uh, long story short, we ended up coming to an agreement that kind of worked for the both of us. It helped his situation and it helped my goals as far as acquiring another property. Right. Man, that's an amazing story. Just thinking about the gaming community, right? Which is uh, seems to be largely, like you said, virtual and you make relationships, you build friendships um, via online gaming and I think it's a great testament to this, our circle of influence and uh, letting people know what we do in terms of getting a referral network to give us a pipeline of, of deals. You know, you're, this was just somebody that you were good friends with uh, over the years through online gaming. I mean, and that there's probably other opportunities out there I could imagine in that space uh, where, where folks would need to sell their house. I mean, it's not much different from, if you're active on a Facebook group, for example, and people know who you are, or you establish relationships or like Nextdoor is another uh, app, uh, platform, maybe you're active there and people know of you as the house guy, then um, you're going to you're going to get referral deals that way. And so I think that's really cool. Really interesting to think about that. So, OK, so, yeah, that, that makes sense about the seller situation. So this is an out of state deal for you. Is this the first out of state deal that you've? that you've done yes it is it is out of state okay um so tell us a little bit about the uh like tell us about the actual deal like the numbers um break that down for us yeah for sure so w w when we were looking on zillow at the time when i was doing some basic uh, numbers on his property um i believe what i saw was 275 or on on the property and um, I asked him, what do you owe on the mortgage? 
he told me uh, the what he owes on a mortgage about one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. And, you know, at the time we were still negotiating numbers, but I knew that I couldn't give him the two seventy five. Right. Because I for me, since I've always bought things conventional lending, I was always looking for a deal right whether a price was underpriced because a lot of my houses i've acquired in the past have been just on market but they were either really undervalued or could use a little bit of rehab and you could force appreciation into them so with this deal um i had offered i'll give you uh you know thirty thousand at first uh to as a down payment and then the remaining uh you know, would be seller finance, right? And we were still trying to negotiate what that was. But what and the deal ended up being was I gave him $40,000 down and then we seller finance the remainder. Um, and we had one balloon and the remaining balance wouldn't be due until 30 years um, from the time of closing, okay? So how those numbers came out was a 15-year balloon would be for fifteen thousand for addition for the additional forty thousand in equity I owed him, and the remaining twenty five wouldn't be due at the thirty year, and that would be the final payoff of the loan. This would be at zero percent interest and zero monthly payments. And of course, there was a little bit of pushback when I had uh, mentioned this, but I was giving him a substantial down payment. Uh, to help him with the situation, which would kind of like maybe delete some of the, the debts that he's been in. And he could kind of start fresh in a new where he was going to live at. And that was really uh, the the motivating factor of our deal with him, because that was going to kind of give him the reset he needed. And he was going to be happy with that number. Yeah, makes total sense. So, you, but he started at 275 for total purchase price. Yeah. And over the course of like negotiating, you came down to, do you remember what the total purchase price was in it? Like 200. Yeah. Yeah. It was like 204. It was close to, yeah. It was like 204 yeah. and some change, right? Right. Um, which, you know, gave me some room for, um, you know, having a little bit of equity in the deal, which was great but also the property wasn't in great condition, right? Like, because if it was in great condition, he could have just threw it on the market. Um, yeah. The issues that were concerns were when I had my inspection of the home done was it needed some new siding for sure. Needed new roofs for sure. The house didn't even have gutters on it. So like, you know, there were some really big ticket items that he was kind of worried about and knew that needed to be addressed. And he wasn't able to address that if he was to throw it on the market himself. So, and not only that, you know, he wasn't sure how long it was going to take to get that all done. And he didn't really want people coming in and out of his house at the time. You know what I'm saying? So there was a lot of different uh, factors that played why he didn't want to put it on the market. I don't know how you own a house without gutters. <laughs> he managed to do it for sure. I've seen like I've seen gutters falling off of houses, but I don't think I've ever seen a house just with no gutters on it at all. Thankfully, there was only yeah. one issue with that, and in the basement, yeah. you did see where the lack of having a gutter caused a little bit of water damage down there, but nothing severe that you know you had mold growing or anything like that. You lucked out on that for sure. Could have been could have been uh, burly. Um, so okay, so you so two hundred five purchase price. So let's that what you said about the seller financing. I think uh, let's recap because that would be confusing to some people unless we really camp on that for a second. So obviously you're putting money into the rehab on this um, at two hundred five. What well first, what do you expect the rehab to be on on the property? So doing my math talking to my contractors it's i'm thinking around fifty thousand dollars would be for a rehab uh okay. for this property okay and once it's all fixed up like after the 50k is put in 
What do you expect the value of the house to be? Um, I talked to multiple agents in the area before I even bought the property to kind of get a after repair value and look at comps. And we were looking at somewhere around 315 would be, uh, you know, a conservative sales price if I decided to exit uh, selling the property. Right. Uh, I think it's great that you consulted agents in the area and so i mean how did you do that did you just reach out to like a random agent off of zillow to just say hey i got a potential deal what do you think it'd be worth and they were just willing to have a conversation with you yeah, so for me since my business i work with a lot of agents i've i've kind of uh, learned how to harness that relationship um but one of the big things i do is i like to join these facebook groups in the local area i'm looking to invest in and I like to ask for referrals to maybe real estate investor friendly agents. But not only that, I did have uh, personal connections in Michigan that I first reached out to to kind of ask, hey, who's a local realtor you might want to know that'd be easy to kind of work with. And um, do, using both of those factors, I was able to get, you know, some agents and ask for their opinion. And and I was able to, you know, get comps for the area and they, they all sent me the comps and you know, that 315 price range was really like that. I always try to, I guess, be co very conservative when I'm thinking about sales price. And I think that was a really great sales price uh, for the price of the home. Right. You mean a conservative sales price? Yes, yes, conservative yeah. sales price. Yes. Okay. Yeah, because doing the math, I mean, well, that's great. Uh, that's a great word of advice, joining the local Facebook groups, uh, networking, um, getting opinions of realtors off of there. Maybe you'll, you'll use the realtor down the road. Maybe they'll get your bus business or earn your business if you ever sell at retail um, or need a like a listing um, agent or something like that. So all in, you're looking at about 255 for your price. If you're at 205, you know, out the door at, at closing and then another 50 grand, maybe 255 ish. Uh, you, uh, you'll have some holding costs as well. But then at 315 ARV, you're looking at about an 80% loan to value there. So so you have an exit strategy to sell at retail and come out ahead on it if if you need to or if you want to. Maybe you'll get more than 315. But, uh, but what is your primary um, exit strategy on this? Okay. Since uh, I was looking to buy this via subject two, um my biggest thing was hey what's the interest rate right um the interest rate was very low threes and um what the piti for the property is 911 dollars and average rents in the area when i was looking at the comps um was between 1800 and 2300 but i always like to be conservative with those numbers and so i just kind of Ted, hey, if I can get eighteen hundred dollars for the home, you know, what's my cash flow look like, right? Obviously, I have to take account for maybe a property manager since it's out of state, um, you know, capex expenses and all that. And I felt like the numbers still uh, worked out with uh, doing long term hold on this property. So yeah, so yeah, so you could be around two thousand dollars of for rent for rents there. Which, um, and if your PITI, if your mortgage payment's only about 900 and maybe you have a management fee on top of that, you're looking at, for a long-term rental, about a $1,000 spread there. We know that some of that will go toward expenses if you actually do a long-term rental, but still, that is, um, those numbers look good on paper. And um, yeah, that, that's what uh, really got me excited because he, being here in the Seattle area, um, it's pretty expensive, right? Homes here are pretty expensive to get into and the likelihood of you finding a, a property that cashes like this as a single family is pretty mm -hmm. rare. You know what I'm saying? So, Right. Plus you have the equity. Um, the one, the, the unique thing to this deal, uh, which is unique among the majority of sub two deals is that you're going to be putting a substantial rehab into, into it. And so you will be putting more capital than is typical like on a on a model where you would sell it on seller financing uh, as opposed to doing a long-term rental and trying to put as little in it as you can so but what's nice 
for in your case is that you have the capital available number one but then number two is that you have some equity there as well and i know that you and i we've talked about there are ways to tap your equity even with a subject to loan via private money lenders um partnerships within the, the land trust um in which you hold title to the property we can talk about that too so you have a lot of options available to you. The cash flow is really good on this one. Um, let's get back. Let's circle back to that seller financing portion, which probably confused some folks because this is really cool. Break it down one more time. So, we, so, so, so you you had a about a one twenty five loan balance on the subject to loan at three ish percent. You brought them forty grand for a down payment, right? Cash at closing. Yes. But then he carried back how much and what interest rate again? So he carried back $40,000 at a 0% interest rate, zero monthly payments. All he, all he required was a one-time time 15-year time balloon for $15,000 of the 40 and the additional remaining balance not due until 25 uh the the, tw the remaining twenty five thousand is not due until th the thirty years, which is the final payoff. Gotcha. So he's carrying back forty grand, no monthly payments, no interest. There's only a a one time balloon of fifteen thousand of that forty to be paid. Uh, how many years in? Was it fifteen years in? Fifteen years. Fifteen years in. Fifteen years in. So at year 15 in, assuming that you, you're still holding this deal, you'll need to figure out how to get 15 grand to him. Maybe it's again, like you said, you pull in a private money lender on the deal or you find some other source of funds from another deal to pay him off. But within the promissory note of the second note that you um, that you wrote to him, there's that stipulation where he's carrying back 40 grand. You owe him 40 grand, 15 to be paid at year 15 and then 20, the remaining 25 to be paid at year 30. Correct. Right. Is that right? That is correct. It's brilliant. Um, th it was really cool to see you work through that with him because that's, that's 40 grand of essentially free money that he's lending you on the deal. Yes. It also uh, oh, go ahead. Nope. No, essentially, um, and, and of course, um, he you know, he did have some pushback in regards to that, but he also knew that I was putting down $40,000 with, with the contingency that I had to still put another 50 to rehab the property. And he understood that like, you know, that work that needed to be done. And he appreciated that I was willing to one, take the risk, right. To, to put it as a long-term rental, do to rehab and give him the 40,000. I think uh, this was where, you know, he felt, hey, he's taking the risk and taking me out of my situation. And the way I saw it was, hey, I'm helping you. You have to negotiate this deal some way. So I felt like uh, we both felt like we won in the deal, yeah. right? Because he was able to accomplish his goals as well. For sure. I mean, I think it, that's a good compensation for you having to, deal with all of those repairs um, because now you have not just the 125,000 at 3% financed, right? That's financed for you via his loan, but yeah. now it's actually 40 grand more. So that totals to 165,000, $165,000 of financing that you procured from the seller with a blended rate because the 40s at zero and the 125s at three something so there'd be a blended rate of probably in the high twos would be my guess um which is really cool good job man thank you thank you <laughs> what what if you hey i don't know if we talked about this a ton because i know your mind's been in uh, long-term rental and you got the rehab ahead of you what have you ever thought about putting a minimum into this thing just to get it habitable again uh may say say maybe 10 to 15 and then just wrapping it on a land contract so um, you could yeah and then you could just still sell it at that higher price so 
really i'll tell you this right like um because i was also curious hey do i really need to spend 50 grand on getting this house like situated and i'll tell you my strategy and i don't know if it's correct right i would love your opinion honestly um the only reason why i was going to rehab it all the way for the 50 grand was because it was going to get the property in such a way that if i needed to exit the property there would be so much value in the work that has been done that i could possibly get more than the 315,000 so me being a first time out of state investor you know obviously my first exit is the long term rental and I'd hold my money in there in a great appreciation area and a great city and great town um but then all my money's locked up right but uh, my, my biggest thing is the fact that I'm spending so much on the rehab as a second exit strategy. Is that a good, is that a good idea, right? Like, or should I spend minimum, just get the roof, the exterior uh, siding done with gutters, and then really do the most basic inside the home? Mm -hmm. um, I just didn't know if, uh, if I may be closing a door to another exit strategy that could you know, potentially benefit me later. Yes. I mean, there's several moving parts to it. What you talked about capturing that future appreciation, in my opinion, that's the main reason to hold rentals. You, you get paid on rentals when you sell them after they appreciate, is my personal opinion. Don't really get paid on the cash flow so much. Um, and so you sacrifice that. However, a lot of seller financiers and note creators, holders, they're going to tell you what you sacrifice in appreciation. You're going to sort of get that advanced appreciation by by marking up the property of the house. So if you put 10000 15000 into it to get it uh, worth more than what you paid. So let's say you paid 205 you put fifteen in. So then that's really like 2 20 that you're in and you're going to mark it up say 10 percent at that price point that's a nice median like price point i love the two hundred thousand dollar price point range it's fantastic if you just multiply that um by 20 percent, maybe you sell it for around 260 um and then maybe 264 thousand would be a, a 10 percent markup and if you're able to get if you're able to hold out for a 20 percent down payment which Again, because this isn't a very expensive house, uh, I think twenty percent is is probably doable to get. You're looking around fifty two thousand for a down payment if you could get twenty percent. Now that's best case scenario. Again, you and I like to look at things from a worst case scenario when we model numbers, but this is a best case scenario. Um, you get fifty two thousand from a down payment, which then pays you back the forty that you paid at closing and then it pays you back 12 um on the rehab so you can be you could potentially be close to net zero in this deal or maybe only ten thousand or twenty thousand in the deal and be getting that two thousand dollar a month payment to you mm -hmm. the the and that would be interest income plus some capital gain um and you're now really a, a note holder, not a landlord. Um, and so it, that's what I would do. That's what That would be my primary exit strategy. You could also put the money in, the 50 grand in if you wanted to, get that value really up. And then you could be marketing this property while there's a long-term tenant in, uh, in there for, for a year. You know, maybe it's just a 12 month lease with no guarantee of renewal and you could be marketing that property after 12 months of holding it for what's a 10 percent markup off of 315 you know that's going to get you into a higher price price bracket so maybe you only mark it up five percent or seven percent or something so let's just go with seven just to be um i knew i know i'm doing some uh quick math here but if you if you mark that up 315 multiply that by 107 let's see like a like a 340 ish price point right okay 
then at that point, you're still going to try and collect as large of a down payment as you can. And you'll have that time to be marketing it because you've got a tenant in there. They don't have equitable interest. You can be marketing it while it's rented out as um, for sale on contract for deed, um, even well before the lease ends. So you could potentially lock in that buyer um, and then you can do an installment sale. So uh, uh, seller financing on contract for deed. Yeah, am I, getting, no. am I getting you thinking? Yeah, definitely. It's obviously it's something I've never done before, but definitely like I see where the benefits of that is. Um, where I I'm still getting the cash flow that I want. I'm able to move on to another deal, right? Because of the down payment that I've, I've requested, so I get a little bit of my rehab money back essentially. So yeah, yeah like I I think uh, you know obviously it'd be easier to kind of follow you if I've done. A contract for deed, um, uh, I guess transaction before, but I definitely understand the concept that you're saying. Yeah, it's 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 simple. It's very simple. You're going to be amazed. Um, the contract for deed versus a full-on uh, wrap note is way simpler because the like the security instrument and the note and all the rules are all just in one document. So whereas with the wrap note, you have a promissory note, and then you have a deed of trust that gets recorded. And all this stuff is um, very legalese and, you know, institutional feeling like the contract for deed is a very short, simple and sweet uh, agreement. And it sets out the interest rate, the purchase price that, you know, they're doing the they're paying the taxes and insurance. You can even get this contract for deed serviced by professional note servicer, which is what I'd recommend, because then they they deal with all of the year-end statements, escrow analysis, and stuff like that. You can even have the buyer pay for it. But it's actually really easy. It's like it's so simple. It's it's almost simpler, in my opinion, than having to think about a lease. With a lease, you have security um, deposit, you have pet fees, other fees, um, and you're managing it all, and you got to keep track of it all. And uh, then on your taxes. You got to, you know, figure out what am I expensing? What's my cost basis? All that stuff. You still got to figure out cost basis regardless. But um, I think it's a much simpler model. So I'm I'm advocating for that. I think I think if I were you, I think, yeah, I think like the 12 month lease. I like that idea because it establishes it as a clear investment property. Then you go and sell it um, and then you can do the installment sale on, on your taxes which allows you to uh, spread out that capital gain over the course of uh, those 30 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's definitely something I, I'd want to look into, probably get educated with, from you with that. But um, yeah, closing my first subject too was a, a bit a bit of a learning curve, but uh, now that I have done one, it definitely feels uh, much more manageable. So. Right. Right. I, I think that's like with anything. Once you take action on it, it makes it under uh, easier to understand. Yeah, and let's not lose sight. Me going off here on this tangent. Um, this for you was a huge milestone, I'd say, for just closing your first subject to deal, getting it under your belt, understanding what the process looks like. And so, if we could talk about that for a second, reflecting back on this first experience of closing the subject to deal. What was that process like? Uh, what were all of the questions that came to your mind and the problems that you that you faced that you had to overcome? So obviously me never done uh, doing a subject to before. Um, I really didn't understand how the process worked, right? Did I need to hire an attorney? Did I need to, you know, find paperwork and um, so I started going in this journey to to try to understand it. And there's a lot of different communities out there that exist, but you really needed to find somebody who, who knew and understood uh, the risk of a subject to. And for me, I'm very, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I am an investor, but I tend to play it safe and really understand what's going on. So that's why I kind of needed to find someone like you, Hans, who who've done subject to deals and could almost walk me through the process. And with your course, you were able to supply me the paperwork I needed for a trust. And I was also able to get the paperwork I needed for the purchase agreement, 
the disclosure forms, everything that I didn't really know I needed until I took took your course. So I, I think um, definitely finding resources uh, helped me out. But the process in finding a title company, I knew that I needed a title company. So I once again, I went hunting onto the local Facebook groups in the RIAs in the area. And I joined those and I started looking for a title company that maybe is a little bit more creative financing um, specialized, right? And I found one doing it that way. The next thing I did was kind of follow the step-by-step -step guide on how to close the subject to with you and you being a resource and somebody I could call really helped me out in the process. But I also asked the title company because, you know, they told me that they've closed tons of subject to deals. Um, I'm not sure if they were doing it a lot like what you are recommending, which put it in a trust to prevent a due on sale clause, right? I also was worried because when I was researching online was if you do the insurance correctly, that uh, you know, that could get you in a big bind and you could get another due and sale clause that way. So really being able to avoid all these pitfalls by one with your guidance and two of my own due diligence, um, I was able to kind of accomplish this deal. Yep, definitely. Yeah, and it was helpful. Um... I, I presume getting on some calls because you guys, you guys really walked through the course material that I provide, like really uh, with a fine tooth comb and you had your questions all written down and on our calls, you, we just blasted through like dozens of questions and there were really good questions. You could tell that you had done your homework. You knew the right questions to ask. And so when it came down to brass tacks during our meetings, during our one-on-one -on -one, um, consultation meetings, it was pretty. It was a pretty streamlined process, I felt like. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Uh, you know, my wife and I, we, we do a lot of our own due diligence, right? And me being an entrepreneur, I always like to be like pretty independent in, in the research that I'm doing. And so when we went through your content, we were literally taking the steps and actions right behind it. You know what I'm saying? So when we were asking, hey, here's the Alta paperwork and this is what it looks like, we'd go through and then kind of circle back with you. And that was super helpful because, you know, this was our first time, like, you know, doing a subject two is so different from conventional lending, right? Because usually your agent or your title company is walking through the whole process and you're you're more in the background ready to sign paperwork well with this i was playing a more heavy-handed role and i needed to understand what the paperwork was and if you've never done it before it's so much easier to go back to someone like you hans who who's been there and, and understands the paperwork yeah and we went back and forth on that alta statement a few times because the title company was good in the long run but i don't know how many <laughs> subject to deals they actually had done because when because when we looked at that alta it was very confusing um we had to put our heads together to say okay what what does this actually what is this trying to say and what does it need to say that it's not saying and and, and they and they cooperated which commends them as a good investor friendly title company uh definitely i agree with you um <laughs> I think I would have not known how uh, unexperienced they were until you kind of told us. But then, like you said, once yeah. we started taking the steps to what you said we needed in the paperwork, they were more than willing to kind of adjust it. And that that made it very easy for sure. Yeah. For one example that is really poignant is just the purchase price on the HUD, on the settlement statement. Um, I remember being not including the seller carry back and the cash amount. So that 80 grand, the 40 carry seller carry back and the 40 the, uh, cash was not included in the sales price, which would have <laughs> mean when you went to go do your taxes later and your CPA said, well, what was your cost basis? Let me see the HUD or the settlement statement. Your cost basis would have been so low and then your gain, so your capital gain would have been another $80,000 you would have had to now you would have tried to go back and say hey can we correct this but um cpa is not going to let that kind of thing 
fly when they're putting together your tax return and calculating that kind of thing. And so it, these are the kinds of things that now with the rise of subject two, you see these transaction coordinating companies pop up, which never existed. Like I never heard of these uh, these these services until the rise of subject two in the last preview in the last several years, because people don't know how to do this stuff. But I've seen TCs mess things up too um, a lot. And I'm like, I don't understand how you can be coordinating the transaction and not and failing to understand what's going on and how to, how to really protect all the par all the parties involved. And yes. that's because they don't have skin in the game, right? They're yes. just a transactional um, service and they might be here today and gone tomorrow, just like a lot of title companies might be here today, gone tomorrow. But for, for, for investors who, who have skin in the game, who've done this, who really know how the ins and outs and how to, how to, how to protect themselves in the deal, protect the sellers in the deal, understand all of the risks collectively for everybody involved. If there's an agent involved, a title company involved, um, really the investor is the best person to ask because they have thought that through somebody who's done this multiple times and is tweaking the system and not just trying to push a deal through to get paid, right? Because you know the risk of this deal. You talked about the due on sale clause a couple of times. You are keenly aware that we need to nail with 100% accuracy a couple aspects of this transaction in particular to protect you from losing your investment on a, on a due on sale clause, right? And protecting that seller too. Yeah. And, and can I tell you, for somebody who's never done a subject to deal, like to think that you can uh, go through the process, yes, you could, right? If you're in a big uh, course or and you're following step by steps, but to not have like a somebody that you can kind of bounce ideas and show paperwork to and be like, hey, here's my situation, right? I don't think I would have felt comfortable because you're right. Like, you know, when you have these title companies and they are telling you, hey, we've done these uh, transactions before, and then you you start asking, hey, are you putting these in LLCs? Are you are you putting them in their own name? Like when they start giving you answers and you're maybe ignorant to the facts of what you need to do, you could put yourself into a lot of risk. Essentially, that's that's what I that's what I was concerned about. And that's why I reached out to you. Yeah. And to be honest, um, well, and you did a great job. Um you know, doing your own due diligence on this deal. So I feel very good about that. You're a shining example of that. But to your point, you know, even myself, I always say, you know, I'm not an attorney. I, I'm not providing legal advice, which I'm not, and I can't. Um, but I have done these deals and I know from the investor perspective, I know information I can provide and what experience I can provide um, I don't, I've heard stuff from title companies, which I don't trust. I've heard stuff from transaction coordinating companies that I question. And even from attorneys who claim they've done these deals before, um, uh, multiple times, which contradicts my knowledge. And so I have to weigh whether or not I'm going to receive that counsel or go with some other kind of counsel. It's a, it's a confusing space. Um, and, and I do, I do agree with you. I surround myself with people who have done these deals multiple times over and have done them successfully without <laughs> without any great ca catastrophes, n knock on wood. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I, I feel the same way that you do. I mean, I'm just kind of echoing your, your, sen your sentiment there. Yeah. Well, that's great. So um, what do you think, what do you think your future holds? I mean, <sighs> In terms of real estate investing, what what's on your what's on the horizon for you next? Yeah, so um, one, I definitely want to stabilize my newest investment in Michigan. Um, just get the rehab done, you know, uh, ensure uh, you know things turn out the way that they're supposed to, and <laughs> hopefully nothing crazy happens. Right, that's what you hope for when you're doing these rehabs. Um, but afterwards. I think um, I'm, I have to just make a decision. Am I going to go the seller finance it to somebody else? Am I going to do long-term 
or I'm gonna, or am I gonna just simply flip the property, right? Um, I'm still in debate to what to do with that. But once, uh, once I that project is rehab, I'll fly down again, check it out, and make my decision then. As far as my other goals in real estate, I am looking into short-term rentals. Um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe Airbnb being uh, one of my properties and see uh, how those numbers would work out. Just because like, you know, as I join these groups and see all the different strategies that are happening, uh, I want to see the cash flow opportunity, right? I've always played the long-term uh, cash flow with long-term rentals. Um, and it's not, it's not it's essentially the quickest way to cash flow, right? So yeah, I'm just exploring other options essentially right now. Great. Do you think you'll do continue to pursue creative finance deals? For sure. Like, um, you know, after doing my first sub two transaction, um, it's really opening my eyes that are like, wow, you know, you can make deals happen without having banks involved. And you can have a situation where two parties are both winning, right? And so for me, I definitely want to look into um, maybe doing seller financing deals where I can maybe roll some of the equity that I have in some of these single family homes and maybe get into much bigger units where I'm getting maybe a five unit or higher. And, and rolling those do deals in maybe via 1031 exchange or something like that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, what, that's really what I'm looking for because I want to hit a goal of cash flow. And I don't think single family is going to get me there quick enough. Remind me, how many of your rentals are single families besides um, the Michigan? Yeah, so all three. Uh, so essentially, my other houses are there are two single families. So all the properties I bought are all have been all single families. Okay. Um, we should talk about seller financing those single, those rental properties and what that would look like because you could capture equity from a down payment um, and turn them into cash flow machines. And then you are recapitalizing from the down payment that you receive to go do further deals, which mm. is what I was suggesting you might consider on this Michigan deal if you could collect 40, 50 grand down payment and put a little rehab into it. Then you could go take that money and go do another deal just like this one and then just just keep it keep it rolling. Yes, definitely. And I want to explore all these options, right? Like as I'm 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 kind of getting the my I'm getting better understanding on all the different ways to do real estate um it's definitely opening my eyes so that's that's cool yeah and and the big the big takeaway here is your first your first creative deal like now you understand on the acquisition side just how actually simple i know that the, your very first time it's never easy or simple but looking back on it um because there's no banks involved, because there's no credit checks, because there's uh, none of the personal financial statements. Here's give me your pay stubs, give me this and that. Uh, we have to wait for approval from the underwriter, thirty days, closing date, all that stuff. Like this deal, would you say that it was almost simpler in a way than a conventional financing deal when you just think about the actual closing of it and what transpired? Um, I can tell you right now. The, now that I've gone through the process and, and then I have the right paperwork and all the knowledge that I have now, I could definitely feel like I could do this deal on my own and maybe look for a title company that's a better verse in, in the subject to space. But um, I definitely feel comfortable, right? Um, I don't think it's super difficult really now that I have the process to avoid due on sale by throwing it into a trust and having my LLC in place and all that stuff. I think the hardest part in subject two is finding the deal and having a motivated seller where you you both can come to an agreement. I think that is probably going to be the most difficult part. And for me, I found my deal through a friend. So now I really have to have uh, different strategies and actually finding the next one. 
Yes, that is the lion's share of the work. I would totally agree is finding the motivated sailor, seller, finding the deal. We can get together on a one-on-one -on -one call, get your LLC set up like we like we did. I think you decided to go with the Wyoming LLC. Yep, yep, yes, I did. Um, we can get together and get your insurance policy set up the right way. Make sure that you're good to go there. We can get your trust set up to make sure that's to make sure that's good to go. But that's all hard work that we could you just really do one time, right? And that's where working together co comes into play. But now you can go rinse and repeat ad, infini ad infinitum amount of times, which is awesome, man. I, I think that's so great to, that you're over, you're over the hurdle. You've proved the concept. Uh, obviously, you have a lot of work to do and some decisions to make on, on the property to get it operational and profitable, which I'm sure you'll do a great job on that. And uh, Maybe we'll have you on again um, once that deal kind of comes comes to a conclusion, or at least you kind of yes. see the light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Um, what What would you say to anybody who might be listening to this who has yet to do their first subject to deal? Yes. Any Any advice to them? Yes. Um, I understand how complicated um, the deal feels. I think anybody at subject to, they're really trying to understand how to even execute the deal, right? And the first things that uh, I think all of us who are new to it get scared of is, is how risky is this, right? Um, for me, I want people to understand that I was taking over a $125,000 loan, right? In worst case scenario, I was able to do traditional lending with that if I needed to, right? Um, would have I felt comfortable taking over a loan that had a balance of four or five hundred thousand uh, dollars? You know, so I was really trying to figure out where my risk tolerance is, and you have to find that as a new as an investor. Um, but what I would say to anybody, get a mentor, right? Find a mentor that's going to help you. Uh, you know, especially Hans, like who's so specialized in this and is willing to walk through with you, because a lot of people are willing to help you and tell you about subject two, but are they telling you the right things? You know what I'm saying? Are, are they doing everything that they need to do with their paperwork so you can avoid the pitfalls in investing in subject two? So yeah, my biggest suggestion is find somebody that you trust that's willing to kind of hold your hand through the process. And I chose Hans to do that and it worked out for me. Awesome, man. For sure, yeah. And it was a pleasure too. I think um, I think you're going to have a lot of opportunities in your in your near future just because you took you were willing to take the risk and the action on this particular deal to get it done. Would have been easy for a lot of people to say, "Nah, the seller they kind of want too much. You know, it's too much cash up front or too much of a rehab or or whatever." But I think you understood the value of proving the concept. Yeah, and like you. Now the concept's been proven, would you say? Yes, definitely. Um, I'm definitely one of those people, take action and figure it out as you go. And um, I, I guess that's another thing I'd want to add to somebody. Don't get paralyzed, right? I know it's intimidating. I know it's scary. But everything I've always done is I've always pushed forward and not let the fear get to me. And um, you'll learn a, a, along the way, you know? So... That's what I would suggest to anybody who's looking into a subject to deal. If you have a great deal, don't be scared to do it. You know what I'm saying? It's easy to come up with reasons not to do deals. Yes. All well, right. Thanks for thanks for spending your time to do this interview. If if folks listening to this uh, want to reach out to you, I know you're in the Seattle area and you have a business that does um, professional uh, photography and video for for real estate, right? Yep. um for like showing houses pictures for listings things like that or if they just want to reach out connect maybe they're in the area or they're new to subject to want to ask you a few questions is there a way for them to get a hold of you yeah like um i i have an instagram for my real estate business it's called pnwvisuals.com um you can you can look up pnwvisuals.com and you'll see my instagram there or you can find me on Instagram at pnwvis, V-I-S, P-N-W-V-I-S. Yep. 
All right. Fantastic. Well, thanks again. And until next time, we'll see you guys on the next one. Bye.